Our first speaker this morning uh, has been working as a type department at Adobe uh, for almost 10 years. Happy anniversary. He's a Portuguese-American type designer, uh, graduated from Reading. Uh, he won a TDC award for his designs. It is my pleasure this morning to welcome um, Miguel Souza. Bom dia. Uh, beleza. Uh, can I have my slides on the... Oh, oi. Uh, thank you for being here so early. Um, it's, it's a good crowd. So um, my name is Miguel Souza, uh, and I work at Adobe in the TypeKit team. Um, there I manage a group of type designers. Um, I write tools. I do font development, and occasionally I get to, to do type design. Um, my Brazilian friends, and uh, by friends I mean uh, all the Brazilians in the room, <laughs> call me Miguel. Verdade? <laughs> no. Miguel. Not Miguel. It's, it's my first time in Brazil. Um, I've been wanting to come to this country for a long time. Uh, a couple... Um, oh, oh, no, wait a second, sorry. Last year, my wife and I had tickets for uh, a couple of the World Cup matches. Here they are. Uh, but this little guy came into our lives. So, so the trip to Brazil had to wait. Uh, but thanks to ATIPI and to my company, Adobe, um, I'm here today. Uh, yesterday, I did some walk around the city. Um, and one of the things I realized was how nice it is to be in a place that uh, it's not my home country, but where everything I hear and I see is in my mother tongue. Uh, it really gave me a sense of comfort that I hadn't experienced before. Um, but then last night at dinner, I chose something from the dessert menu, and this is what I got. <laughs> That's right, a, a full-size calzone uh, stuffed with grilled banana and hot chocolate, smothered with caramel and with a lump of vanilla ice cream on the side. <laughs> I, I, I swear I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know I was going to get this candy, uh, on a pla candy store on a plate. Um, it's clear that I need to work on my Portuguese. Um, <laughs> So, so now that I got you uh, all sick, um, let's get to business. Uh, it's a great honor and an enormous uh, responsibility to have three people in the room, I think, at least two are here in the front, um, that uh, know more about what I'm going to present than I do. Um, they know it because they lived it. Um, and many of their decisions have led to uh, what type at Adobe is today. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with uh, whom I'm talking about, um, here they are. Sumner Stone. <laughs> the, the former uh, director of typography. Thomas Finney, the former product uh, manager for fonts and global typography. Are you here, Thomas? No. And, Dave, and uh, David Lemon, the current senior manager for type development. So guys, uh, uh, if I mess up, please correct me at the end, okay? So let's do this. Um, Adobe has more than 30 years of experience in software development. Um, and in recent years, it has successfully entered into the digital services business. But uh, what many people don't know is that this company has been a font, a font technology and type design powerhouse since its beginnings. This expertise is in its DNA and has remained the core asset over the decades. Let me, take, let me take you on a journey that starts at the dawn of the desktop publishing revolution and concludes with the rise of the open source font development. So chapter one, the beginnings. Adobe was founded by these two men, Charles, G Charles Chuck, uh, Geschke on the left, and John Warnock on the right. 
They met uh, each other in the mid-70s at Park, a uh, research facility in Palo Alto, California, owned by Xerox, or Zer Xerox? Xerox? Xerox, yeah. While working at Park, uh, Warnock developed an idea for a page description language, and together with Geschke, his manager, uh, they tried to convince uh, Xerox to use the technology in its products. But after two years of failed attempts, the two men decided to leave Park and try it on their own. And together they started Adobe in 1982. Their original business uh, plan was to develop an integrated system of hardware and software for the high-end publishing market. The system would be uh, interconnected using John's page description language. Uh, by the way, these two um, pictures have nothing to do with Adobe. Uh, but they're cool and uh, they give you an idea of what the integrated systems uh, of the time looked like. So, page description language is a, it's a sort of programming language that can describe elements on a page. Uh, so something like, um, here um, are images with X and Y dimensions. Here is text, a text block set flush left in font times at size 12, and so on. Um, as, sorry, I think I skipped, yep. As Adobe was working on the, on the software component of its system, uh, later known as PostScript, they were approached by Steve Jobs. Steve was developing the Macintosh at Apple and revealed that also in development was a laser printer for the office environment. He tells John and Chuck that he has the hardware but is looking for a good software solution to connect the computer to the printer. The Adobe man knew that PostScript would fit the bill. At first they declined to license it to Apple uh, because the original idea was to sell the full system, not just the software. Plus, Apple's uh, laser printer had low resolution, only 300 dpi, and Adobe was more interested on the high-end market. But later, Adobe agrees to license PostScript to Apple, and in January of 1985, the laser writer is announced. This is the first printer with PostScript support. The Mac and the laser writer were part of Apple's vision of the new office environment, which was up to that uh, point dominated by IBM machines. But what Apple didn't, did not anticipate was that the Mac personal computer and the office laser, laser printer were about to take a part in an enormous uh, revolution. You see, the Mac came with a word processor and a drawing app, uh, Mac Paint. They were easy to use and they allowed people to produce documents to be printed. But they weren't very sophisticated. So if you needed to make a more complex layout that included text and images on the same page, you were out of luck. Unless you knew how to write PostScript code by hand and then send a PostScript file to the laser printer. That would work. But uh, realistically, how many people could do that? Certainly not designers. So it wasn't until the launch of uh, Adobe, uh, uh, sorry, Aldo's PageMaker in July of 1985 that things changed radically. PageMaker had a graphical user interface similar to what we use today and supported the PostScript language. Designers could now create their own documents in a WYSIWYG, uh, what you see is what you can get uh, way and then send them uh, to, to the printer. So, the Mac computer, the laser writer, printer, the page maker application, and the PostScript language were the things that sparked uh, what we call the desktop publishing. Uh, but I would like to add one more element which I believe was as crucial to the success of DTP um, as these other, these other things, and that is scalable fonts. By the way, all the things uh, on this page uh, were developed by three companies, which, uh, which names start with the letter A, Apple, Aldos, and Adobe. 
Okay, uh, a cute computer with a WYSIWYG interface connected to an output device that can print text, images, and graphics all on the same page. It doesn't seem that extraordinary um, by today's standards. But uh, it, it is a big deal if you consider that at the time, office computers looked like this. Office printers were of this kind. And these were the tools you had for composing a page. And this was how you set headline text. So you first had to create the layout by hand, specifying all the fonts and their sizes. Then this would be sent to a typesetting company that would produce a high resolution output. These high res prints were then cut up and pasted on the final uh, layouts. So you see, DTP was quite a big deal. Another cool feature um, that shows paste ups was a serious business, uh, science, sort of. Uh, as I mentioned previously, PostScript was what uh, got Adobe started. But, but PostScript was also responsible for initiating the company's type development efforts. Right around the time when PostScript was developed, there were other companies trying to solve the same problem, coming up with a device-independent graphics system. What does this mean? It means uh, having a single language to communicate between a variety of computers and printers, being able to um, handle text and graphics side by side, and be resolution independent. So the same file could be sent to a 300 DPI laser printer or a 1200 DPI image setter. PostScript had all of these features, uh, but what set PostScript apart from the other solutions was its ability to handle scalable fonts instead of requiring handmade uh, bitmaps for a variety of sizes. That's right, uh, before PostScript, the fonts used on computers were bitmaps of a fixed size. Here uh, are the original Macintosh fonts. And these bitmaps were what was sent to the printers. PostScript changed this by introducing scalable fonts. These fonts resided in the memory of the PostScript device, and because they were uh, made of vector outlines, they could be scaled to any size uh, and output at the highest resolution allowed by the device. Uh, notice how the bitmap on the larger S is not um, a scaled up version of the smaller one. So to demonstrate this groundbreaking, groundbreaking technology, Adobe included a small set of 13 fonts in, post, in the PostScript software. These included, included a basic collection of designs, um, a sans serif family, Helvetica, a serif family, Times, a fixed width a family, Career, and the symbols font, Symbol. Helvetica and Times were licensed from a third party company, and Career and Symbol were designed in house. As a newcomer to an industry where companies traditionally copied and cloned type designs from each other, Adobe wanted to be taken seriously by its future partners and competitors and send the message that it, it cared about type. So it licensed Helvetica and Times from their rightful owner, Linotype. To develop this core set of fonts in PostScript Type 1, the newly created digital font format, Adobe established a task force within the company that eventually led to the creation of the type development team. Today, this group is still alive and well in the organization, proving again and again that type is a timeless need and that Adobe cares about it. Chapter three, original type design. Despite its success, uh, it was clear that the desktop publishing solution lacked in font selection when compared to traditional typesetting systems. To help establish PostScript, Adobe knew that more, than, uh, more digital fonts uh, were needed. The quickest way to build a library was to license existing designs. So the department's early days were mainly focused on digitizing fonts that were owned by the established type companies. In addition to Linotype, 
Adobe soon secured a deal with ITC, International Typeface Corporation, to convert its collection to PostScript. Other type companies followed suit, uh, like ACFA, Berthold, CompuGraphics, Monotype. To lead this effort, type designer and calligrapher Sumner Stone is hired in 1984 as director of typography. His role was to engage with third-party uh, foundries to create the collection and to develop new designs. He almost immediately starts working on what would become the first original type family design at Adobe. Stone. Stone Serif, Sans, and Informal, released in 1987, made up the first superfamily design for the PostScript era. Apple's second laser printer, the Laser Writer Plus, uh, introduced in 86, uh, contained more designs licensed from Linotype and new designs licensed from ITC, bringing the total number of core PostScript fonts to 35, which is uh, 22 more than its predecessor, the or original Laser Writer. These fonts were all developed at Adobe by the type team. Realizing the commercial potential that fonts had, Adobe releases the first Adobe Type Library in the spring of 86. It included more than 100 fonts. They were all from Linotype and IDC, except one, Sonata, which uh, was designed by Cleo Huggins at Adobe. With this release, Adobe, um, with this release, Type becomes Adobe's first shrink-wrapped product, a full year ahead of Illustrator version one. Stone knew that uh, he wouldn't be able to grow the selection of original designs fast enough by going at it alone. So in 87, he hires Robert Slimbach, with whom he had worked at Autologic. Like Stone, Slimbach uh, was eager to work on original designs rather than to fiddle with the existing ones. He immediately starts working on Garamon Revival, on a Garamon Revival, Adobe Garamon and a general purpose design, Utopia, which became the two first releases of the Adobe Originals collection. Does this look familiar, Sumner? <laughs> One year later, 88, Carol Twombly joins the type design team. Her first typefaces were Trajan, Charlemagne, and Lithos, released in 89. Around the same time, other team members were converting wood type designs to the new medium. Here's the first collection, released in 89 as well. The team's vision of uh, wanting to revive the art of fine typography by doing original designs and to show how this new technology could surpass the old was starting to materialize. From left to, left to right, that's uh, Jim Wasco, Robert Slimbach, Carl Twombly, and Fred Brady. Also part of the team was Linnea Lundquist, who's not um, in the picture. As desktop publishing was taking off, so did the, uh, the Adobe Originals program. The team saw the tremendous opportunity to create new digital types that stretched the boundaries of quality, technological sophistication, and scope. They knew they needed a few really solid historical revivals to prove that this new medium could live up to the metal type and phototype industries. And, it, and they could not be in a better place to execute this vision. Adobe provided the perfect environment. And so the Adobe Origins collection continued to grow. 1980 saw the release of the second wood type collection. Uh, the fonts were, developed, uh, were designed by Barbara uh, Lind, uh, Kim, Kim Bucker, and Joy Reddick under the direction of Carl Twombly and Fred Brady.
Another revival, Adobe Caslon by Carol Twombly. And Minion by Robert Slimbach, a Renaissance-inspired design that has earned a place on the list of workhorse classics. To supplement the output of in-house type designers, the program also published uh, typefaces commissioned from outside designers. Tecton was the first in 89 by David Siegel followed by the wild type collection in 93. Clearly a fatal attempt to broaden the library style. Um, and several others in the subsequent years. Here's just a sample of them. Ex Punto by Jovica Vejovic. Mez by Michael Harvey. And Jimbo by Jim Parkinson. Some of the more recent uh, families designed in-house include uh, Germont Premier by Robert Slimbach. Um, this is Robert's uh, second Germont design. The first was Adobe Germont. And uh, this is a more authentic version that incorporates the full range of optical sizes which were cut by Claude Germont and Robert Grandjean. Arno, also by Slimbach. Hypatia Sands by Thomas Finney. Adobe Text by Robert. And Trajan Sands, uh, also by Slimbach. Also noteworthy is Adobe Clean, Adobe's uh, corporate typeface. And its serif companion. These fonts are exclusive to Adobe's branding and are not available for licensing. A few other lesser known designs made in house as well are these four handwriting fonts. They were developed uh, at the request of Acrobat for use in document signing workflows. So on to the next chapter, groundbreaking technology. So PostScript was developed for printers, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, it enabled the use of scalable fonts. But this ability came with a huge challenge. You see, this is what fonts looked like on screen. You could use the fonts at any size, but if you didn't have bitmaps for that particular size, the text was poorly displayed. You were still able to design and compose the page, but the what you see is what you get promise was not quite there. To, see this, uh, to solve this problem, Adobe developed Display PostScript, which essentially printed to the screen the level of detail compared to what could be achieved on paper. A few years prior, uh, Adobe had successful, was successful um, at licensing PostScript to Apple for the laser writer. So um, as a logical step, they approached uh, Apple again to make a deal on Display PostScript. But Apple declined. At the same time, um, well, at that, at that time, Steve Jobs was no longer at the helm of the company. And the current management had no desire to depend on Adobe's technology any longer. And uh, they were also not happy with the ongoing licensing fees they had to pay for PostScript. So Adobe approached Microsoft, who had uh, become an important player in the software industry after achieving a huge success in, in the personal computer market uh, with its um, MS-DOS operating system and later with Windows. But Microsoft declined as well. In fact, Apple and Microsoft were so eager to not depend on Adobe's technology that the rumor was that they had started developing alternative solutions to PostScript and to Adobe's kept secret font format. The official news finally broke at the Siebel conference in September of 89, where Apple and Microsoft announced the intention to cross-license their replacement technologies. Apple would get a PostScript loan named TrueType, and Microsoft would gain access to a new font rendering technology, later known as TrueType. 
Warnock was furious, and he wasn't afraid to show it. For him, <laughs> for him, this meant war. Apple and Microsoft, once uh, Adobe's partners, were now teaming up to take down the PostScript company. And you have to realize that at the time, in 90, 1989, Adobe's revenue was made up of 65% from PostScript licenses, 10% from fonts, and 25% from applications. So clearly, the livelihood and future of the company was definitely at stake. John didn't take the rumors lightly. So at the same conference, he fought right back by announcing two major things. An upcoming font rendering solution for the screen, later known as ATM, Adobe Type Manager, and the public release of the PostScript Type 1 specification. ATM was a huge achievement. It was released a full year before the first true type fonts came out in May of 91 as part of Mac OS 7. This secured uh, Adobe's future and it also meant that type on screen was no longer heavily jagged. What you saw on screen was now much closer to what you got from the printer. Here's again the version without ATM enabled. And by publishing the Type 1 specification, Adobe was no longer the gatekeeper of the secret that made its fonts and the fonts of the foundries that, that had licensed Adobe's tools when they're so well on screen. You see, at the time, uh, there were two PostScript font formats, Type 3, uh, which was open but didn't support hinting, and Type 1, which was closed because it supported hinting. Later, in 92, Adobe introduces Multiple Masters, an extension to the Type 1 format. Multiple Masters enabled a single font file to basically contain all the weights, widths, and styles of the whole typeface family. To select which weight or width you wanted to use, there was an interface in ATM that would let you pick virtually any variation within the typeface's design space. Myriad, designed by Robert, Slim, Robert Slimbach and Carol Twombly, was the first family to take advantage of this new technology. Multiple masters also allowed to bring back the optical size adjustments that punch counters did to typefaces in the days of metal type. Small sizes uh, have sturdier features, while large sizes have finer details. Here you can see an A and a G set in Arno at the same um, size for comparison. On the left is the caption style, uh, where the stems are heavier and have less contrast so that the letters remain legible when used at a small size. And on the right is the display si style. Um, it is meant to be used at larger sizes in headlines, for example, and the letters show the, the design's f finesse and subtleties. Uh, unfortunately, the multiple masters technology didn't last long as a consumer product. But the concept of interpolating between master designs is still, to this day, very much alive in the type development environment. 96 marked the end of the font wars as Adobe and Microsoft partnered to announce a new font format called OpenType. Open type um, has many advantages over type one. The, the fonts are cross-platform. They can include more than 65,000 glyphs, uh, allowing a single font to support many languages and scripts. The small caps, ligatures, old style figures, and other alternates can be included in the same, um, same font rather than being in separate fonts. And the format enables the uh, correct shaping of complex scripts such as Arabic and the native scripts of India. Chapter 5, Non-Latin Type Design. Adobe's non-Latin font development started as early as 92. The first non-Latin original uh, was Minion Cyrillic. 
This was Adobe's, uh, this was Robert's idea to lead uh, the group, uh, the group's design efforts beyond Latin. Uh, since he believed that it was one of the most useful things he could do as a type designer while being in, employed at an international corporation. This line of development was so new and there was, and there was so little information about it that the group had to commission a study on Cyrillic orthographies in 1990. This study served as the basic basis for the definition of the first Cyrillic character set. Because uh, Adobe was also interested in entering the Japanese market, a lot of the early non-Latin development uh, was focused in the three main East Asian languages, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, collect collectively known as CJK. Postscript was again the, the main driver of this effort as Adobe negotiated with print manufacturers. Similar to the deal that had been made earlier with Linotype for the digitization of Western designs, Adobe signed an agreement with Japanese company Morisawa for the conversion of its font collection to Postscript. The first Japanese font designed and produced in-house was Kazuka Minshu. It was designed by Masahiko Kozuka and Adobe's Japan's Japan, Japanese type design team. It was released in 97. The year 2000 saw the release of Minion as an open type family. This conversion to the new format allowed for the Cyrillic glyphs to be included in the same font along with the Latin. And this version was also the first to include Greek. Lithos, another design that received Greek support during its conversion to OpenType in 2000. The design is based, is based on inscriptional Greek, so this extension was very fitting. Interestingly, Carl Twombly drew most of the Greek um, or, uh, while, uh, she original, when she originally designed the Latin in eighty nine. Myriad was another family which was expanded to include Greek and Cyrillic when it got converted to open type. The Greek was designed by Carol Twombly and the Cyrillic by Fred Brady. Warnock, designed by Robert Slimbach and released in 2000, was the first family where the Greek and Cyrillic were developed in parallel with the Latin. Since then, most of the new families designed in-house have included Greek and Cyrillic. Adobe Arabic and Adobe Hebrew, released in 2006, were our first Middle Eastern designs. At the time, we didn't have the design nor the technical expertise to develop these, so they were commissioned to Tyro Typeworks. Tim Holloway designed the Arabic and John Hudson the Hebrew. Tiro uh, also, uh, was also in charge of developing uh, Adobe Thai and Adobe Devanagari for Adobe. <coughs> Both of these uh, were designed by Tim Holloway and Fiona Ross. The Thai was released in 2006. Um, the Devon Agri was ready around the same time, but it wasn't uh, released until Indic support was added to Adobe's apps, which happened in 2012. Kazuraki, a calligraphic Japanese font designed in-house by Ryoko Shinizuka, was released in 2010. Uh, after several years of development. In Kazuraki, the glyphs are proportional in both horizontal and vertical directions, which means that they don't follow the usual 1,000 unit square grid used by almost all East Asian fonts. This revealed to be quite a challenging uh, for many uh, applications, as the, as the font broke many of the long-standing ass assumptions related to Japanese text layout. In 2009, a new version of the AFDKO was released. AFDKO, also known as FDK, is a collection of font development tools that we use for making fonts. This new version allowed us to finally produce Arabic and Indian fonts in-house as the tool now supported complex script development. In 2012, Mirith Arabic and Mirith Hebrew are released. These were designed and produced internally.
The design is by Robert Simbach, and the production work was shared between myself and my colleague Paul Hunt. Other complex script families uh, have been developed since then, in particular for the many languages of India. Adobe Gurmurki by Paul Hunt and Viva Singh was released in 2012, followed by Adobe Gujarati and Adobe Tamil in 2013. The Gujarati was designed by David Bergina and the Tamil by Fernando Mello. David and Fernando are both graduates of the Masters in Typeface Design from the University of Reading in England. Neil Lakash Kshitrimayam, uh, wait, Kshitrimayam, that's it. Also a Reading graduate, designed Adobe Bengali, which was released last year. And uh, there, are, there are several more uh, Indian projects in the pipeline. So on to the next chapter, open source efforts. Being a traditional software company, Adobe Type didn't really catch on to the open source de development until fairly recently. In August of 2012, uh, we released Source Sans, our first open source family. It was very well received and it has been adopted by companies and institutions for their branding and online presence. Its range of weights, its broad language coverage, which includes Greek and Cyrillic, and its nice design really set it apart from the many other open source font projects out there. My opinion. A month later, in September 2012, we released Source Code, a monospace companion to Source Sans. The reaction to this family was even bigger than Source Sans. We were completely blown away by how many times the fonts were uh, downloaded. Even though the design did not yet have an italic, nor it supported Greek or Cyrillic. These uh, are extensions which we released recently. Uh, but both Source Sans and Source Serif, uh, sorry, uh, Source Sans and Source Serif were designed by Paul Hunt. But uh, a super family system with a monospace and a Sans Serif uh, fonts would not be complete without a Serif design. So in May of last year, we released Source Serif, which was designed in-house by Frank Grishammer. This family uh, has the same weight range as Source Sans, but cur currently only supports the Latin alphabet. And uh, an, it an italic style is also in the works. Also last year, we released Source Han Sans, a pan CJK family. This was a massive project, which would not have been possible without a partnership with Google and with three Asian uh, foundries, Iwata, Sandal, and Sinotype. The family is made up of uh, seven weights, and each font has more than 65,000 glyphs, providing full support for Japanese, Korean, traditional Chinese, and simplified Chinese in a single file. This, uh, this was the first pan CJK family ever to be made, and its glyph count is at the limit uh, of the font format. And so, for you to have an idea of what 65,535 glyphs look like, <laughs> this is it. Um, and yes, most of those are the, the, most of those tiny specs are ideographs. In addition to fonts, uh, we've open sourced type tools, and font technology. In May of 2013, we announced that the font rasterizer used in Adobe Flash was contributed to FreeType. The rasterizer is the piece of uh, code that converts the glyph outlines into images that can, be then, that can, be, that can then be displayed uh, on screen or printed. This was one of Adobe's crown jewels, dating back to the early days of PostScript. So you, you can imagine how big of a deal this announcement uh, was, both for Adobe and for the many companies that use FreeType. And uh, more recently, in September of 2014, we released uh, the AFDKO in, on GitHub. The project has received a lot of support, 
and occasionally um, and occasional con contributions from outside developers, which is great. If you'd like to get uh, to get these open source fonts and the tools, or if you're interested in contributing to the projects, head over to GitHub. These are the URLs where you can find everything. So, chapter seven, what's next? The font industry has changed a lot in, the, in these last 30 years. Adobe led the way and continues to be a front runner in typeface design and in front technology. The company's focus and main uh, sources of revenue have changed dramatically over these three decades, but type has remained, <coughs> excuse me, but type has remained a core component. The acquisition of Typekit in 2011 brought the expertise we needed for serving fonts to web browsers and mobile devices. Since then, Typekit has expanded its scope and is now a backbone of a seamless solution that delivers fonts straight to your desktop. And there's more to come. As we enter the next 30 years, I don't expect things to change much. There will be more typefaces, both commercial and open source, more, more type tools, and more font technology coming from Adobe. Because we know that's the only way to stay in business and to remain relevant in this industry. And because type is our passion. Thank you. Is there time for questions? Yes, we have, uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Anyone wants, wants to ask anything or to correct anything? Wait, they're trying to turn on the, they're trying to turn on the mic. Yeah. Uh, what was the file size of the open hand PDF that he showed the, the full glyphs? Uh, <laughs> could, I ha could you email it to me? Yeah, I can email it to you. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think it was several megabytes. And the one time, um, uh, I, um, I, for, for those familiar with uh, Mac OS, uh, you can select a, a file and then hit the space and get a, a, a quick preview. One time I did that with that file and it crashed the, the finder. So. <laughs> It's big. It's big. It's, it crashed the finder. Yes. Source Hans Hans is about 15 megabytes per weight times uh, seven weights? Seven weights, yes. Yeah, so you know, 100 megabytes ish. But, but it covers everything. Uh, Pan CJK. There's Bruno here. There's uh, John Barry there. Thanks, Miguel, for making Adobe's um, development seem entirely planned and coherent from beginning to end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I think is interest was worth pointing out. You you mentioned multiple master and said it didn't it didn't last that long. And I think that it's worth pointing out that there are two reasons why the multiple master technology did not last and as a retail product. One of them is that service bureaus, where you had to take any high resolution f output files and to be output, uh, most of them hated it and many of them had trouble with it. Others had no trouble, but it became a sort of uh, de facto resistance. But the other is that Adobe itself shot itself in the foot. Despite all the support of the, the fonts team, the, um, the, the, the app developers, the app teams simply were not cooperating and yeah. nobody took the, the logical approach that this should not be a high-end tool at all. It should be built in as the default so users get this effect without having to think about it. Yeah. So that's what killed it. Yeah, yeah it's true. The, the, there, were, there were illustrators supported it. Uh, there, was a little panel, there was a little panel where you could um, um, specify uh, in, new instances right there on the app. 
Adobe InDesign still supports the fonts if you have the fonts installed, but it didn't go much further beyond that. As I understand it, there was a division of uh, too many, the people that had the opportunity felt you would either be interested in quality or you would be interested in, in mass. Uh, and instead, it should have been built into the most basic products, not the highest end products, yeah. and invisible, totally invisible. But you know, another aspect was that uh, multiple master fonts were a little bit more complicated to complicated to uh, market um, because uh, I mean for a, a f it's easier to to say okay here's the family with 40 fonts um, as opposed to say here you're paying for uh, one single file this much money um, and uh, to try to explain that to the customer was a bit complicated and then uh, in addition to that was the, all the the technology um, um, problems that that customer had to face. <laughs> Bruno, is here? Um, can you tell me, is the Han Sans Pro, is that a GB18030 and is it certified for mainland China? I don't think it's certified yet, but uh, we are in the process of doing so. Uh, is that right, David? Yes. Oh, okay, cool. And uh, you know, considering it's 15 megabytes large, how do you propose to put that into the digital environment, e.g. into web streaming, uh, onto mobile devices, you know, because no one is going to accept that. We, kind of we are already doing that. Uh, uh, David wants to say it, to answer yeah, that. Uh, as, as I mentioned on uh, when, uh, Wednesday, uh, we, this is for web streaming. We use subsetting and uh, on-the-fly augmentation, which makes it totally manageable. And how about those who are not using uh, Adobe's... Uh, subsetting technologies, say, for example, like any old corporate who wants to use the hand pro. They have to. <laughs> East yeah. Asian fonts don't work on the web without subsetting. And, and, and yes, it's, the font is open source, so they can roll out their own solution. But, but yeah, the, the, what uh, we have um, working is a, a solution that delivers glyphs on, on demand, basically. Yeah, but I could surely I can embed the font file onto my own server and just serve it myself. Mm -hmm. But that would be, require me to have to rebuild the fonts completely so that I can bring down the file size considerably. Uh, yeah, but I'm not sure I follow. But but I mean, th the way we do it is we we as uh, we analyze the page and then we deliver just what's needed. Oh no, I understand how Adobe does it. That's that's mm -hmm. that's not the question. Monotype and Google also offer subsetting solutions. Yeah, but do you really want to be tied in with Monotype? But, uh, but honestly, Bruno, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what, what. Uh, I'm not sure what you you are. No, but say for example, corporate X Y Z takes you know uh, Sansos Pro Han, right? And they want to serve it via the web, and they don't want to go through Adobe. They don't want to go through TypeKit, SkyFonts, or whoever serve, you know does that. They want to have their own server solution. They would have. Hmm? Then they need to develop it. Yeah. So why wasn't it developed with that in mind in the first place? Actually, there are multiple versions of the fonts available uh, of different sizes. Uh, I, I'm, I'm working on the team at Google that was partnered with Adobe on this. So there are multiple versions. Um, Multiple Available subsets. Available with different sizes, different subsets. So if you want just Korean, you can get just Korean. You can get them in, in a lot of different flavors. In fact, maybe too many flavors, but there are still are, there are a lot of flavors. In fact, there's even one that is all of the weights, everything in one giant OTC, which is very nice to install on a Mac. Gr horrible for, for using as a web font. But if you want to just download Korean, you can get one that's about... What is it now? I think if you will, once it's waft, it's it's down to like about two megabytes. So so there's a there's a whole variety in the source Hans Hans versions and in the Noto versions. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Better. Okay. Yeah. Um, hi Miguel. Hi. Could you could you comment on the new parametric system uh, presented at Adobe Max recently? Uh, I, I cannot, and uh, the reason I cannot is because I know as much as all of you about it. Maybe a little bit more, but not that much more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you, Henrique. We, 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 we were as surprised as everyone else. Wow. We, we knew it, something was coming, but that was, it, it was a separate team, and, and they have their own ideas, and uh, we understand what they're trying to do. 
we have mixed feelings about it, but I mean, it, it, it doesn't, what they showed doesn't mean that it's going to go out the door or it's going to be released. This is just a, a, pre, a preview of what's, what, what people are, what Adobe is, is doing in-house. So this is just an exploration at this point. And we are in, in, in uh, we are now in contact with them and trying to, to understand what, what, what their, what's their vision. We we need to keep the Swiss the, train on tracks and on time. Can can Sumner say something? <laughs> Mr. Stern. It's a nice way to end. Thank. Um, thank you, Miguel, for the, for the for the presentation. I, just as a kind of a point of reference as to how far um, things have progressed. Since 1984, when I started, I was employee number 25. <clears throat> and um, everybody in the company at that point, uh, if you wanted to write a memo or a letter, and this included the, you know, the people who were uh, administrative assistants, you had to write a postscript program in order to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Warnock insisted. <laughs> And he would come around and teach you how to do it himself. <laughs> Impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you.